Hello everyone and welcome. Um, this video is on the back of uh, the video that we've just done to celebrate our 500 subscribers um, because we spoke about doing some more technical videos kind of behind the scenes and you know some bits and pieces about what we do and how and why and um, we had some positive feedback in the comments so here we are. What we're going to do is what I'm going to do, I should say, is put up five questions. So there's going to be five parts to this video, and the text or the questions are going to be on screen now. And they're probably going to cover up most of my face, which is probably no bad thing, because it's a big head and fills a lot of the screen. So what are those questions, and what's this video about? Well, number one, the moment anamorphic lens, what does it do? And we'll go through that in detail. Gimbal filming, number two. How do we use the gimbal? Uh, tips and tricks and pros and cons. Number three, what cameras do we use and have and why? Number four, tripods, fluid head, filming tips and tricks. Now, number four is going to really be more about um, what we do to get scale video, real scale video, to make your trucks look like the real thing, because that's been our goal from the very start of this channel when we started it nearly two years ago. And we've learned a lot and we've developed a lot and there's a lot to it. So that's the section that you want to look at if that's what you're really interested in. Number five, it's what are we going to try in the future? And that would be important because there's lots of changes coming to the channel. We're going to be doing lots of different things. So you'll notice with the questions, uh, there are numbers up behind them. Uh, well, after them, and that corresponds to which section of the video in time that section appears is going to be broken up. So that means you can skip backwards and forwards. Hopefully, you'd like to watch the whole thing, but if there's one thing that interests you more than the other, then you can go and look at that specifically. <coughs> okay, so let's get into it. Number one, the moment anamorphic lens. What does it do? Well, here it is on its case with its nice little lens cover on. Um, what this does is it squishes the footage, okay? It changes um, how the image is projected onto the camera sensor. So recently, and a lot of people do this, they put black lines, cinema lines, to make the footage more cinematic because when you go to the cinema, footage looks amazing, doesn't it? And it's always that crop. Um, Majority of cameras these days will record in 16 by 9 and you know you can get editing software that puts black lines on. Trouble with that is often it will cut away some of your footage and you know you're losing picture density. You also have an issue that you're filming it and then you're going to be putting these lines on the top and bottom so you're cutting out the footage. What this does is it gives you the cinematic effect um, but it squishes the footage down so that when you um, bring it into your video editing software, the bars are already there, so it records like that. Now that's a very, very clever thing. Um, it, it gives you an amazing bit of lens flare, it really, really does. And, and during this whole video sequence, I'm going to be putting up example footage of that. It's just the way it's, I don't really understand the science of it, but it just does. It gives you this kind of like sci fi kind of like horizontal flare off of any kind of lights that you get. That might be car headlights, RC lights, street lights, that kind of thing. And the sun as well. It, it really does look very, very special. So I'm going to do a quick jump cut and we're going to go into uh, this in a bit more detail. And look. So a more detailed look at the moment lens itself. Um, it's metal. Uh, it's a really nice piece of glass. Comes with this um, lens cap, which is a nice touch. And as you can see, you know, it's, it's really well made, very impressed. Um, it's, you know, certainly better than some of the clip-on lenses that I've seen and used and messed around with. So it is a really, you know, good bit of kit. Um, I will put the link in the description um, to where you can get it from. It has these collars on the back and you have to have a specific case for it. Um, for your phone. My phone is a Samsung Galaxy S9 and you can see the indents here um, for the actual collar so it just kind of it slides in and twists and it's a really nice kind of 
action, if you like. It's very, very sturdy. It, it, it goes on so well. Uh, it's very impressive. It, it's not cheap, but you know, you get what you pay for. Um, you can see, therefore, in the inside, um, you know, it just sits in these collars here. The case itself is very good. Uh, I use for my Galaxy S9 spidging cases, uh, and they're you know they're quite well they're, they're quite well made and they protect well. They've got a raised edge, and this actually I wouldn't be um, afraid to use this moment case as my you know daily user, as it were. Uh, very impressive and the lens is very well made so as I said um, earlier on this lens it squishes everything down in the footage so um, it, it basically changes the aspect ratio so it, it projects the image differently onto the camera sensor so you can't just use it on its own with the normal camera software, camera recording software that you get with either Android or Apple. They do do Apple cases um, and various Galaxy cases. I'm not sure what other phones they do, uh, but they do a few. So you have to use specific software. Now Moment do their own app and own software um, that you can record through. And I will go into detail in a moment as to why you need that software uh, with a practical demonstration because yeah, the, this lens squeezes everything down. It squeezes the footage into that letterbox format. It changes the aspect ratio. So therefore, if you're using your normal camera um, app, then it's not going to know that and it's going to look weird. Um, and I will give you that, uh, that example just now. Let me um, put the phone in the case and fire up the app. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. So this is Filmic Pro. That Andrew and I use. Uh, it's a great bit of software. Uh, it really gives you very, very good controls. I'm not going to go into details about the software because it can be quite complex. Um, so yeah, there's lots of videos out there. But this app does work with this lens, which is fantastic. So yes, it's the Filmic Pro app. So you might be able to tell that everything looks rather skewed. So the truck doesn't look normal. You can see it's kind of squished. Um, you know, it looks like funny wall of mirrors kind of sensation. So to stop that, you have to go into the settings, go into hardware, and there you can see Moondog Anamorphic 241 adapter. If we turn that on, it does its thing. There we go. The footage looks normal and you get the lines. Uh, top and bottom. So when you record in this mode and you then download the video onto your computer, you put it into your video editor, you then will see it as it should be and it will be the cinematic bands. I will put some footage up so you can see what it looks like straight out of camera. It's it's fantastic. You, you get some amazing lens flare with it. You get some really nice cinematic effects I found that the cinematic effects are better when you uh, have got scenery in the shot. So you pull away from something or the truck, you know, you've got scenery in the background um, behind the truck uh, rather than when you're just up close. When you're just up close, it kind of, it just looks normal, really. Um, there's nothing majorly special about it. But it's certainly a really nice bit of kit. We've only just done, we've done two runs, one day run, which I did on my own, and one night run. Um, when you see this, that video will probably be up. And yeah, it's brilliant. We, we need to experiment with it and mess around with it some more. Andrew's going to get one as well. I, I can't really um, compliment this lens enough. It's well made. Um, it does make the phone quite heavy. And if you're going to put the phone in a gimbal, you need to be careful about balancing because it will, you might need to buy a counterweight for it. Moment don't just do this lens, they do various other ones, I think a telephoto and a fisheye lens as well. And, and having used this one and seen the quality, um, very, very impressed. So yeah, you can, oh, I've started recording. So you can use Moment's own app just to record video. I haven't tried it, to be honest, um, but Filmic Pro is something that Andrew and I both use, so it's got the adapter, so why not? You know, 
use it. So yeah, it's very impressive. We really like it, and um, go check one out, definitely. Gimbal Recommend filming, highly. and how do we use it? As we've said on the channel before, uh, this is the gimbal that Andrew and I have got. This is a Zion, or Zion, however you pronounce it, uh, Smooth 4, and it's for mobile phones. So, you balance it, I'm not going to go into details exactly about how you use it, but I need to balance it first because this is for a different camera. So we're almost there, there we go. Um, tips and tricks, well, gimbals as far as we're concerned aren't really designed for RC scale filming. <clears throat> you can obviously adapt them to use them for many different things, but they all work slightly differently and this is the third gimbal I've tried and there's nothing wrong with the other ones but this works best for what we use it for and it was quite cheap as well uh, it was £100 when I bought it but I think you can get it on Banggood for 75 I'll put a link in the description and what they really do is keep your camera nice and steady they also follow you as well your hand movement so twisting this is where some gimbals differ. Some, some of them have different modes and will do different things. This one I like um, because one, it's quite cheap. Two, it's reasonably fast for panning, as you can see left and right here. Um, it also has two modes, a lock mode, which I've put it in now, which means that it won't pan at all although we don't tend to use that very often, but the standard mode is the mode that we use 95% of the time, which follows you round as a pan, but it doesn't tilt. Now you can make it tilt by various, using a different, you know, a specific button, or you can manually tilt it, and then it will stay in place. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of the details about this gimbal, because that's not what it's about. Is tips and tricks and how we use it. Now the reason why I say that gimbals are not really good for scale filming, uh, you have to use tips and tricks to get them to work, um, is that most people when they use gimbals, it's for vloggers and thing, people walking around landscape cities and you know places of interest, and you will hold it like this, out in front of you, um, and that's where all the buttons are accessible, uh, the twisting is most responsive from the motors. Now one thing I will say is that the motors, they do lag behind and different gimbals have different speed and torques of the motor and they react at different you know, time frames if you like. And you need to get used to, if you're using one, how to twist it when and how fast you need to twist it. Uh, this one's pretty fast to stand, which is what I really like. The other ones I t I've tried are, are really sluggish, and, and that's not good for, for RC, really. But the other problem comes in when you have your truck, okay? So you film in your truck, and you, you have to get down low, okay? Now if you're doing a video where the truck is running along, you can't crouch down as a squat, um, unless you're some kind of Olympic athlete and run alongside. So you either are like this, having the gimbal you know, sideways on, and at that point it's not quite as reactive. If you can see I'm twisting my wrist here, it's nowhere near as reactive as, as if I'm doing this. And that's because the gimbal isn't really necessarily, so it does work and it, it will twist, but there is a definite knack to how you need to do it. And the other issue is that because it needs to be scaled, you need to get the truck in the entire frame. Now, that's very difficult because you've got to stay a certain distance away. Now, really doing that kind of filming along is, is better when the truck is on a raised elevation so you're on a slope and that's when we use it for. Underneath it's got a tripod connector so I use a Manfrotto extendable like um, monopod if you like 
And you can get selfie stick poles that extend that do the same job. So then you're holding it at some distance away and that makes it even harder to get the gimbal to react to what you want it to do. Slower gimbals are even worse, but this one's, this one's quite good. You have to get used to how it, it's, it looks and how it reacts and the type of shot that you want to get. Now, most of our shots really are inverted. So, this is where this gimbal is good again, because others that don't have a standard mode that, that do pan but lock every other axis, you can't do this with. Well, you can, but you've got to fiddle with it and turn it round, and, and it's a nightmare. Whereas this is really easy. You're walking along, you put your pole underneath. I'll just press the button so it's turned. You put the pole underneath, and there you are. So we tend to walk alongside the trucks like this. So you get all these low shots. Now, I will put various video clips up um, that you can see as an example. Now, Again, you've really got to be um, very assertive and you've got to know how much to twist because if you twist too much, you know, you're, you're trying to come round the truck here and you think, right, I'm actually going to, I want to get a nice smooth shot of the truck of it going in front of the truck and you do that, you're going to basically get a shot past the truck and it's not going to work. The trouble being as well is that you can't see the screen because you're standing a good few feet up above where it is. So there's a lot of guesswork and, and there's a lot of trial and error. And we've done that and it doesn't always work. There's a lot of footage that we have that nobody ever sees because it's too close, it's too wobbly. I mean, the thing to watch as well, although this is stabilised, when you've got it on a pole and you're walking along, the tendency naturally from your arms is to do this. And even if you don't realise you're doing it, I mean that's accentuated, but it will, it will, it will bob up and down as you sway from one side to the other as you walk. And, and while it keeps it stable on three axes, it, it won't stop, you know, it will, the camera will go with you as you bounce up and down. And that's very difficult because, you know, you're trying to give this illusion that because of a scale truck you want to get down low and it's right in front of you and it's filling your vision. And that's what we're trying to do with video. And that's the idea of scale video, that doesn't work if the camera's bouncing up and down or if it's you know twisting and turning too quickly. So those are issues that you have to consider and the right gimbal and, and this Zayun Smooth 4, Zayun or however you pronounce it, is very very good for that. Andrew and I are going to actually do some tests where we measure the distance we need to be because at the moment we genuinely there's a bit of skill to it in terms of you know roughly what it's going to look like because you can't see what's going on on the phone screen because your head's up here and the phone's down here um, yeah it's a lot of trial and error and takes a lot of practice and, and these videos filming scale trucks it takes a long time it's all very well sitting in here and playing around in a nice warm environment <coughs> but when you're out and about in the wind and the rain or indeed in the sunshine and you've got mosquitoes biting you and you're walking along, it's not easy because there's two of us and we tend to try and film both trucks at once or not have big gaps in, in between both trucks running. So we tend to, well I tend to, film and drive at the same time. And I do that mostly and I've put a big cable tie on the wheel of my transmitter so I can thumb steer and then film with the other hand. So often, if you see the gimbal work, I it will be me driving and I will be filming. And that's some, well, quite often really, the shots of Andrew's truck are better, better frame, better place than shots of mine. Because trying to drive and film, really, we shouldn't be doing it. And I think that's something we're going to stop. <coughs> and we'll talk about that in section five, question five, I should say. So because you're walking along, you are trying not to step over logs, hidden dipped in and there's loads of leaves especially this time of year um, you know I'm forever walking into things falling over tripping up because it's so difficult you're steering trying to drive scale you know steer everything trying to use the gimbal it does give an amazing effect um, the one thing about that is that I can tell now from looking at other people's footage when a gimbal's been used because you can tell as the motor reacts 
the, the kind of motor's got a torque to it, and it, it's it's kind of you can just tell by the way it pans. Gimbals are great; they're really good and they're rock steady. But there is a downside, and that downside is they're not as good as as a very smooth, fluid head on a tripod. It, you get a completely different look. I shouldn't say not as good; they're different, um, and you can tell the difference as well. So this is why that you need to think about just more than one option because if everything's on the gimbal, we try not to use it too much. It all gets a bit samey. So moving on um, about that. So those are the tips and tricks. You know, get down low. Um, trying to think about how you're framing, and they are difficult to use for RC trucks, definitely. And and I've had to do a lot of trial and error to get it looking okay. And there's more work to come. About the gimbal and the connection between the gimbal and the phone, you can have um, apps and things that are, that come from, you know, that go with the gimbal that attach to the phone. So all these buttons on here can do things. There's lots of buttons, twisty wheels, buttons, recording buttons and things like that, that allow you to um, manipulate what the camera's doing. As in section or answer one, question one, we use Filmic Pro. Now Filmic Pro, has a specific hardware plugin for this gimbal, which is great. And we've tried, <coughs> I've tried specifically to link it to this and it works very well. You have to do it via Bluetooth and you have to have your location on for your GPS, otherwise it won't connect. But I've stopped using it because it absolutely hammers the battery life. It's incredible, it really, especially when it's cold uh, in the winter this time of year. The other thing is, because we don't use this as it's supposed to be used, like a vlogger or someone doing, you know, walking around a city, when you're using it and holding it like this, these buttons are easy to use. They're all hand, and, and it's very difficult, you know, you're not likely to hit something by accident. However, Filmic Pro, as good as it is, there are so many buttons, every single wheel and click does something and takes you into another menu. It takes you out of auto mode, it puts you into manual mode and focusing and everything else. It is an absolute pain, I find. And for the, you know, the idea really is you press a record button on here and it records on here so you don't have to touch the screen. But as well as draining the battery pretty fast, what happens is because we're holding it out at different angles and we're, you know, we're inverting it, we're upside down, it's so easy to hit one of these buttons. And if you hit some of these control wheels in Filmic Pro when it's connected, it changes the focus, it changes the exposure, and it is practically makes it quite frustrating. And because again, you know, the main issue, the camera's down low, you can't see it, you don't know what it's doing. So you know, you, you, you have it upright, Press the record button, great, everything's set up, you do that, and as you turn it over, you accidentally hit this with your thumb, finger, or whatever, and it's changed, and then you don't see. So you're, you're walking along, you get a great shot, and you think that's brilliant, um, and it's not. So what we've decided to do now is just use, what, me, because Andrew, I think he might continue to persevere, but I just, it's too clumsy for me, so I'm just gonna use it on the screen. That way, whatever you do on here doesn't interfere with the phone. You also get better battery life as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the gimbal's great. It's just try not to use them too often. Uh, different cameras, different looks, keeps things flowing and not be too samey. So that's it, really. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it, there are some issues like everything. <coughs> they might seem like a really good idea to use all the time, but you can't really use it in isolation. And you, you need to be careful about how you do it and how you frame. You know, Andrew and I are gonna do some testing about just keeping a certain distance so it fills the frame nicely. There, there's quite a few shots we've done where you've got half of it in and, and not the other half and things like that. So it can be a bit of an issue. So yeah, that's it for the gimbal tips and tricks. Welcome to part three. So this is, what cameras do we have and why? Be a fairly short section, so he says. Um, just to explain to you what kit we've got and you know, why do we use different cameras? Simple as that, really. Um, first of all, this is my fairly newly acquired GoPro Hero 7 Black focus camera. Thank you. And yeah, I've had a, I had a GoPro Hero 4 Black that I got bought 
by my amazing wife as a wedding present in 2014. Uh, didn't go wrong, it was absolutely hammered and I used it all the time and then this came out. So GoPros, I love them, I really do like them. They do have their limitations. Uh, I bought this really because it did 4K 60 frames per second, although we can't, we haven't got computers powerful enough to edit in that, so we, far as we can go, both Andrew and I is 4K 30 frames per second. But this is better quality than my GoPro Hero 3. It wasn't a 4 actually, I stand corrected. And it also has awesome image stabilization. So my plan was really to not have the gimbal um, because it's a bit weighty carrying it around. And this was really nice and light and I wanted to treat myself to a little present because I like GoPros. The stabilization on this is fantastic. I will put up some footage now actually of the MC6, the first MC6 uh, run when Andrew had painted it red. That video is live on our channel, but I will um, cut to a bit, we'll put a bit up uh, of that tr truck being filmed with this camera. As usual with GoPro, it's a bit fisheye, but it's not as bad as the earlier models. You can set it to linear as well in certain modes. But it's nice and light, it's easy to get into places. I've got a waterproof cover. It's supposed to be waterproof without the case, you know, a proper big chunky case, but I've got one of those for when I put it on top of the rigs and things because I don't want to risk scratching the lens. But you can literally just put this on like a selfie pod and walk along with it, bang, away you go. It has also got an LCD screen, um, which is really, really good. And yeah, it, it's just a handy camera to have. It gives you a different perspective. Now, the reason why, reason why we do have different cameras is because they give you a different perspective and a different viewing experience. And I didn't appreciate that at first when we started this channel, and it makes a really big difference. Um, maybe if you're not really that into camera work and you're not really paying, you're just watching. Uh, but Andrew and I are both into cameras. We always have been. And you tend to notice these things, right? So when you shoot with this, which is my Panasonic Lumix, GX80 or GX85, depending upon whether you're in the UK or America, we're in the UK. It is what they would call micro four thirds camera. Um, and I sold my Canon 60D to buy this camera. This isn't obviously the standard kit lens. This is a 1260 with image stabilization. I bought it second hand um, off of eBay. When I got the camera, it was in very good condition. It gives you a decent level of zoom and you know, flip out LCD and all the rest of it. It can do 4K um, 50 frames per second. So this operates on the system where it does um, 25 frames and 50. It also does 24 frames as well. I'll take the lens cap off. But again, th th this gives you a different look. Um, Andrew has got a Panasonic video camera, a VX870, I believe, um, and there are differences between the two, quite quite big differences. And this, I, I don't think you can substitute a, a camera that's got a decent lens with decent glass on it. I really don't. I, I the, the, this is better than the video camera. The, the actual clarity of it. Um, when they're even when they're both in the same settings, I think it's got a slightly higher. It records at a slightly higher bit rate than the video camera, but when you watch footage of it, and again, I will put that footage up um, on screen. Just move the camera down. It it, it really does. You, I can tell the difference when something's been shot with this. You get really nice zoom effects. There is a big negative with this camera. And that big negative is that it doesn't focus very fast at all. It's horrendous. The also focus, I've read reviews saying, oh, it's a bit slow, and I thought, oh, that's fine. I probably wouldn't have bought it if I'd have known what it was like. You get round it, it's a very, very good quality camera, but the autofocus isn't fantastic. It's quite annoying. So it, it, it does limit what you can do with it. 
the Canons and Sony equivalents focus much faster. I'm not sure how the quality is, but to be honest, I wouldn't sacrifice the quality of it um, over focusing fast because you, you can get around that. But yeah, the footage from this is, is superb and it, it deals with low light better than the video camera. So I haven't got Andrew's video camera here with me. He's got it. But the video camera is as you would expect. It focuses really fast. It's really quick. It zooms in and out. It's got good zoom. But it just gives you a different look. And, you know, that's what different cameras are about. To make it so it doesn't look the same all the time. The other thing that I use is my Samsung Galaxy S9. Which is great optically. The phones are superb. Phones... Oh, look, there's my reflection. Ooh. Ooh, scary. Um, what I'm recording this on now is the Samsung Galaxy S7, which Andrew and I bought for the specifically for the channel. Phones are great; they focus fast. You know, um, as an example, oh, it's going to let me down now. Yeah, it's going to let me down. That's that's difficult. Um, come on, kind of, kind of. Yeah, well, <laughs> it does. Believe me. Um, so yeah, I've started using my S9. So that's three cameras that I have got, and Andrew has got his Panasonic um, video camera. He's also got his Huawei P20 Pro, I believe. And it, it just gives a different look. We don't ever really tend to put just one camera down on a shoot. We tend to use all of them most of the time. And that's great. It makes editing a bit more difficult, uh, as I will go on in section four. But yeah, I think if you want footage to look different, having different cameras, even just two, just changes things up a little bit. Um, it, you know, it makes it more exciting. And I think, you know, there is a, a big difference and I can tell. So that's what we've got. And that's why we use it, why we've got different things. Okay, hi, it's Andrew and this is take five. And uh, it is 10 to 10 on Saturday night. I am tired. Um, and I'm on the beer, so this could get interesting. I'm here to talk about, for the fifth time, my video camera and numbers, frame rates, bit rates, okay? And what they mean to you, um, they are very important, so do stay tuned, okay? But I'm going to try and get through this as quick as possible. I'm going to try not to swear because. Um, Although, isn't that probably a good thing, just in case, you know, YouTube think this is for kids, because this is very kid-friendly, isn't it? Um, well, if any of the little fuckers are watching, um, it isn't kid-friendly. Go away. Get a life. Go and play football or something. Jesus. Anyhow, let's create Now we've got the, the kids out of the way, let's talk about my video camera. For it is a video camera. It is not... Um, a proper DSLR or digital camera, or the, the micro four thirds or bridge camera, any of the other strange and wonderful names. What happened to the old days when you either had a proper camera or you had a Kodak? Right? What happened to those days, eh? Um, anyway, this is a proper video camera. Um, I chose this video camera because I started with one of the earlier models with the channel. And when we went to 4K, it seemed a natural thing for me to do to upgrade um, from a, a, a different Panasonic video camera to this Panasonic video camera. And this is the VX870. Um, 4K capable. And I love it. I think it's great. I think it's marvellous. It isn't perhaps as good as Terry's, I would say. It certainly isn't straight off the card. Terry's footage off his Lumix, of his GX80, I think it is is immediately more attractive than the footage that comes off of this and I think without a shadow of a doubt his big lens on the front and I'm a, I am a bit of a photographer so I kind of I do appreciate having good proper lens glass is always going to win so yeah his produces probably the better image no not probably definitely the better footage but once I tweak this a little bit in the editing software it comes up just the same and I very much doubt that anyone's going to look at our videos even in 4k and really notice the difference yeah I don't think they're really going to notice the difference uh, at least I hope not hmm. um, 
I can imagine his head's getting bigger right now. But yes, Terry, your camera is better than mine optically. However, and this is another reason why I went for this type of camera, is the advantages that these have are different advantages to the ones that Terry has. So with this camera, I have a built-in 25 time optical zoom. So not digital messing about, it's just the glass doing the job here. 25 time zoom. And I've put a clip together this morning in the garden, which I'll start playing. So you can see that, um, I don't know, maybe here, <gasps> maybe there, not sure. It's all magic to happen later. Um, showing the, the zoom capability of this camera. And it's quite impressive, I have to say. So when you see pictures of, of a truck coming through, a, coming towards the camera usually, um, down a path or something, over a hill, um, that'd probably be my camera. So I've zoomed in with the telephoto, compressed all the distance, and um, uh, really flattened the image out. That, that's probably this camera doing it. Terry's Lumix is wider, it shoots a wider image so than I can. So if you've got a close-up, the, the truck going past the camera kind of thing, it's maybe gonna be his, it certainly won't be this one. Um, and the focusing on this is its other strong point, um, which I think it's better than Terry's for sure. Uh, whether it's a big difference, a big improvement, don't know. But also look at the footage now, you see how the camera is tracking the um, big orange there as she not only comes towards us but turns uh, and even as I zoom in and out you'll see how the focus uh, reacts really quickly and doesn't hunt around it doesn't go back and forwards back and forwards oh and then I found it it locks it straight in which is really nice really good rarely ever do I have to bin footage that I've taken on this because of focus issues um, Another nice thing that it has is, is a, a good tracking facility, so I can, um, I, I can set something up in the viewfinder, frame, frame a truck in the corner, say, and then I can tap on the screen and it will lock onto the truck. And as the truck moves across the viewfinder, it follows the truck, so the focus is always on the truck. Um, it, it, yeah, it's got, okay, optically it might not be quite on par with Terry's, but um, in terms of producing usable footage, very, very good. I, I rarely throw anything out from this camera because of uh, technical shortcomings in the footage. Um, it's, uh, it, it is very good in that sense. Um, sometimes with Terry's I see things not focused properly or it focuses within the shot, within the move, you know? So it's blurry, oh, click, then it's into focus, which um, is something that I think we could do with working around. I don't like it doesn't happen in Hollywood movies, right? Oh, it's oh, there it goes. Found it now. That doesn't happen in Hollywood, right? So um, that's something we could we could work on. Um, it's just about understanding the cameras as well and shooting to their strengths, you know. So uh, so that's what I shoot with um, with the microphone on usually, as I say, um, to keep the sound keep it uh, recording the sound in front. Uh, not the sound behind, which is a problem with our previous videos, uh, early footage, where we just used the, the built-in microphones. They, they pick up sound from all around. So when we're blundering around in the background, uh, you can hear that, which is not really very good either. Um, and uh, so the directional mic clips onto this, and I can just take sound from the front, and it's better quality sound at that. So uh, as long as I remember to switch it on, <coughs> otherwise I get a footage with no sound at all, <laughs> it's great because it, as soon as I plug this in it kills the internal mic obviously um, and uh, if I haven't switched it on though it's uh, silent movie time, yeah um, that's happened a few times but um, yeah that, so I'll shoot with this most of the time um, to keep the sound high quality and uh, pointing in the right direction. Now I also shoot with the phone that is recording this, which is a Huawei P10 Mate Pro. Huawei, however you want to say it. The one that Trump doesn't like. So it's two years old and it served as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to using it as my second camera because it's going to get replaced by something nice and new and compatible with the Moment lens system that Terry's just got the anamorphic lens. 
um, which I found. It's my idea. I'm not having him stealing that. I researched it. I said it was a good idea. He just had a compatible phone, and I don't. But they don't make cases. And he's, as he's explained, you have to buy a case, and the lenses clip into the case. So as long as you the case fits your phone, beautiful. They don't make them for these phones. Fabulous. So I've got to wait and upgrade to a phone that is. So it'll be either a Pixel 4 or more likely a Samsung um, S10 Plus, I think, is what I'm looking at. Um, I'm not an iPhone fan. Sorry, never will be, never have been. Um, and they're colossally expensive, so no. Anyhow, so that's that. Uh, yeah, so that's the gear. That's what it is. Yeah. So the tripod Terry's talked about, a little Velbon tripod thing, but mine doesn't have a flappy head on it. Uh, it just has a more traditional uh, up and down, round and round. Um, I do like his fluid head. I will tell you, I do like his fluid head. That's going to be a good thing for us to have. So I'll probably get one of those uh, after Christmas, probably. Welcome to part four. So part four, tripods, our new fluid head, filming tips and tricks. Now that's scale filming specifically. So, <coughs> excuse me, I've pretty much got everything that I own in terms of tripods and bits and pieces. So the fluid head tripod here, I've got, which I'll go into um, shortly. That's literally just been purchased, arrived last week. Um, my little tripod over here, uh, which I'll go through. Of course, the gimbal, which you've seen, and then the Manfrotto um, monopod, if you like, but I use this as a kind of selfie stick, so it will go on the bottom of the tripod like this. Um, and in the, sorry, bottom of the gimbal even. So as I spoke in section two about using this low level, um, this is what we use. So it just means that you can film close to the floor while you're standing upright. We also use this monopod for the GoPro as well. So that works really, really well. It's nice and light, really easy to use. So just a little GoPro tripod attachment that you put on the bottom here. So this tripod, quickly. Now, we don't use big tripods. We, for scale filming, it's important that you get down and low, okay? You can't really, or you shouldn't really film up high. The only time I tend to do that is if I'm filming the 6S crate and bashing, I'll put some video footage up. I put the GoPro on a hat cam and it just doesn't look scale because you know, it's not, it's a small car. And that's the same with the crawlers. If you stand up high and you film on a regular tripod, you are, it's not going to look scale. It's going to look like a small toy truck running around in, a large open space and it won't look right. I've just noticed there's a big crack here in my shell. No. Oh well. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've only just noticed that. Oh no. Anyway, I digress. So that's why we need to have small tripods. Now, there are lots out there and I've tried quite a few. Andrew has a similar one, but mine's better because it's got more features. Uh, let me move this out of the way so it's not quite in shot and we can focus on this more. So this is a Velbon X macro tripod. Now there's two versions of this, the cheaper one and then my one. My one here has got a removable head which, you know, the, the locking uh, tripod attachment, which I think is vital because uh, when you're walking around doing scale, scale filming, which I'll go to in a moment, you have to carry it around, you have to take the camera on and off. You, you don't wanna be walking along, even with this folded up, in some of the places that we do, with an expensive camera perched on the top all the time. And I don't want to be screwing on and unscrewing uh, my cameras all the time, because if you do that, I mean, threads are only, you know, threads will only last so long, especially when you're out and about, it's easy to get dirt in them. You might cross thread the, the, the um, tripod mount thread in the bottom of the camera, which obviously is not good. So this tripod's great because it's nice and small, rubber feet, it's nice and sturdy. The important thing is that on here, it's got little fold out clips 
So, and it does it on each leg. Because often we're on heels, um, you know, we're, we're not on flat level ground at all. And that's why it's important to be able to fold it out. So you can get really low with this, really, really low. And it's very stable and lightweight. It will also extend out if you need it as well, which is really useful. Um, and recently we've been trying, well, I've been trying to do, you know, panning shots, trying to get things, you know, to look slightly different. Because at the moment, the only kind of panning and follow shots we can do are with the gimbal. And because of the way the motors work and because of, you know, the way they operate, they only give you a restricted look, a certain look, if you like. So this tripod, usefully, has got a, a mount on it and it's greased in here and you've, you can tighten it and loosen it. Now, I was trying to do some follow tracking shots like this, tilting up and down, but it's not a fluid head and that's what you really need a fluid head for. It, it does work left and right quite well. You can do panning, but it doesn't work up and down because um, of course I've got this the wrong way at the moment. So the up and down is, is operated on this screw here. So you, you can't, you can tilt it left and right, but you can't tilt it up and down. So what I was tending to do was hold this and tilt it up and down with my hand. And I got some okay shots with the Lumix and the mobile phone, but not quite. So I was been, I have been searching for a fluid head. Now they don't do small fluid heads. They're big because they're again, this is one we're doing a scale RC filming uh, video is because the average tripods, you see the fluid heads are made for a normal big, fairly big metal tripod. Even the travel ones are fairly big. So I was looking for a fluid head Manfrotto one to go on top of here. But when you put the fluid head on, they are pretty big, even the micro mini ones. And then you've got the camera on top. Now this tripod wouldn't support that. You'd end up tipping it over. It'd end up falling around. Uh, not good at all. So lots and lots of hours of hunting and I found the Joby Gorilla Pod with Joby Fluid Head and I was very skeptical at first. I have got, Andrew and I have got, um, you know, the, the kind of Gorilla Pod. I have a, the 1K one. So you get a 1K, 3K and a 5K. Now that's how many kilos it can hold. So this is the 3K. And it just popped up on a YouTube feed and there's hardly any videos about this at all. And I was thinking, oh, is it gonna work? I'm not sure. And I ordered it and they are expensive. They're a hundred pounds, but I found this on eBay from a seller, brand new, um, for 58. Now that's still quite expensive and I was a little bit skeptical about how good it's going to be. Um, but it's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. I don't really like, I mean, I find these a little bit like a Rubik's Cube. When I was a kid, I never, ever, ever solved a Rubik's Cube and I just end up getting frustrated and throwing it at the wall. Uh, once these aren't straight and you leave and you get them out of the box and they're no longer straight, I can never get them back again. I just, uh, it's, I didn't really, you know, it's very frustrating um, and it's quite fiddly to get it level, but they do work quite well and they stay put. Now, it's got an arm on it like this, so you can twist it round and up and down. And the adjustments for the fluid head are via here. See that, that adjustment changes the up and down axis. And it's actually that fluid look, it, the camera just will, will flop down if it's that loose. It's a good part, bit of adjustment. So if I adjust it and tighten it up slightly, it, then it's a lot stiffer and much, much stiffer. It also has adjustment here for panning as well. And I have to say, let me flatten this out a little bit. I have to say it really is very, very good. So if I, I tend to have it on, the, when I've tried it, it's been on the loosest, one of the loosest settings, but it will glide really nicely. Again, it isn't quite level. There we go. 
that's better. So yes, it will glide really nicely. Just touching it with my thumb, up and down. And I haven't, I've tried this in the garden today and I will put some footage up in a moment of me using it because the gimbal is very, very good, but it gives you a certain look. So I could have just put this onto the gimbal. You can get gimbals for bridge cameras, but I didn't want that look. I wanted something that is really, really smooth. And, you know, having this decent lens on it, you zoom in and out, you can do some really nice distance tracking shots zoomed in. And I am very impressed with this for the price. I think it's brilliant. It's still, I mean, it's quite large, but it's still fairly compact and it will hold an SLR, so they say, but I can use a phone on this um which is absolutely brilliant so let's put some of the footage up that i've taken earlier on today uh, this is just in my garden so the first one here is me just fairly zoomed in running up the garden so as the truck drives away i'm kind of moving it keeping it steady left and right and i'm accentuating the movement here on purpose just because i wanted to test how good it is and following it around the garden, it's so, so smooth, really, really good. And, you know, you, you get gentle movement, which is fantastic. You don't want anything jerky. So this is a, a good example of it panning from, you know, one side to the other. And then in a moment, um, I then kind of pan down as the truck gets closer. And I like the fact that, you know, you can then now see coming into focus the inside of the truck, the figures in there. And you, you can't really do this on a mobile phone. It doesn't work as well. The optics are just brilliant, which is, which is why this, this camera having a decent bit of glass on it. Uh, the focus isn't brilliant, doesn't focus very fast, but it, it works very well. So the second shot here um, is me down the side of my house. So I wanted to kind of do a shot as an example of panning downwards. And it pans down really nicely. I'm tracking the truck, having a problem steering here, um, keeping a look on through the camera lens and watching the truck. But again, the camera zoomed in, it's, um, the truck's coming closer to me and I'm having to adjust the angle on the actual fluid head and it, it's, it's brilliant. I am really impressed with it. And uh, I cannot wait to try this out properly. So again, you can use a phone on here. It's got a really nice metal um, try mount that you actually mount this to with quick release as well. So all you do is you unscrew this here, pull that in and out and you can unclip it. So it's a quick lock. Um, yeah, very, very impressed with it. And I think Andrew is probably going to get one, uh, I think is what he said. I'm not surprised to be honest. So let's go into the issues now with scale filming. So when you're out and about and you've got all this stuff, we carry rucksacks. Now I've got to get all of this, you know, I take tools for the trucks in case they go wrong. We take one tripod, well, at least two tripods, at least two tripods. If not two tripods, we'll take one tripod and also the gimbal. So that as well. And plus with that, you know, for low down shots, the pole. So you're getting on for a fair bit of weight and those rucksacks are on our backs and we are walking in, you know, non unforgiving terrain, let's shall we say, lots of mud, especially in winter. And in the summer when you're doing it, you're roasting hot and mosquitoes biting you and things like that. So, you know, this point of, I mean, the footage you just saw, to make this look scale, you have to get down low. You, you, you can't be filming it from up high because it just, you know, there's a certain level that it just won't look right. And you've got to get down on the floor. So in the winter, we wear waterproofs, wellies, and we do lie on the floor. You get muddy, you get down and dirty, and you get absolutely filthy. It's just the way it is. And you, you have to. And we didn't at first. And when we first started doing these shoots, it they didn't look quite right. Everything was a bit too high. The angles weren't quite right. Also the distance. Now, if you're really close, 
you can get some close driving shots going past, but if you're really close it, or too far away, it, it doesn't work. And it also depends on what you're, the terrain you're driving over. Now remember, you know, the trucks are scale, but what you're driving over, the mud, the logs, twigs and everything else, and the landscape is not scale. So that's something to bear in mind. You know, you, you can't just drive it over something and, and not consider what it looks like through the camera. You have to try and make it look scale. Like, you know, imagine that you are the camera and you that's what you are seeing. You are seeing this truck at this distance, you know, to get it to fill the screen, to, to make sure that, you know, it doesn't, uh, things in the background don't make the truck look like a toy although it is and that's a very you know it's a very tricky thing to do and there's no simple answer to that other than get down and, and trial your shots basically so you know doing different camera angles more than one camera so often you know Andrew and I will have a camera facing this way onto the truck we'll also have a camera you know facing behind the truck looking backwards so we'll get a shot from the front um, a shot from the rear or we'll also maybe hide in some weeds or bushes or trees or whatever and, and get a distant shot with the Lumix um, going through which is why you know you need some cameras that work well close up you also need cameras that can do some distant shots now those distant shots work really well and I will um, put some footage up it's important that you drive scale so if I put the camera down for a moment if you've got your truck and you hammer the throttle, it's going to just jump forward. Okay, the, these you know the crawlers are very bouncy, especially the SCX. I mean that's the standard suspension. It's really bouncy. So if you're you know got a decent torque motor in it, if you're mashing the throttle, it will jerk and it will bounce. And if you drive it fast, it will bounce and jiggle all over the place. So if you drive it like a you know a, a basher no matter how low you get or what camera angles you do, you're never going to get it looking scale. That it just will not work. Um, you have to be gentle on the throttle, which is why there's this thing about, you know, what um, speed controllers you've got and setting up, you know, exponential rates on your throttle and things like that so that you can drive smoothly. Andrew and I have spent a lot of time with all of our rigs trying to get them to, you know, when you touch the throttle, they don't jerk off and they, 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 they don't, you know, kind of, some motors and speed controllers that when you, you drive along, they kind of pulse a little bit and you get this kind of rocking motion as you're driving the truck. And, and that really doesn't, again, look very scale. The, the MCs look more scale than these just because of the weight. The weight's important. If you buy a ready to run fairly light truck, and I had um, an FTX, uh, I think is it the Outback, um, first of all, and it was super light and it was bouncing all over the place and it, and it, it never really looked like a, a scale truck. So that's been our, our mission. So driving scale, steering scale. If you're steering really fast, real trucks don't do that that they don't steer really quickly. You know, you, you power steering, you're turning the wheel and there is a gradual, you know, set amount of steering um, angle applied. And remote control cars, they will steer really quickly. Um, uh, if you turn the wheel, they, they will steer. And we've got, especially if you've got a high powered servo in. So it's about, you know, setting your steering up or steering gently, applying the throttle gently, coming over obstacles gently. Uh, everything needs to be done with with you know scale in mind to stop it jerking to stop it going too fast because again you know you're running through the forest or whatever if you run over something that you know a, a small twig that's equivalent to a big car running over you know <laughs> a, a, trying to run over a tree stump if you like you know a small street tree stump so of course it's gonna you know jerk and then it will ruin the look so that's what we're always after you know does your shot look interesting? Frame it up um, and make sure it looks, you know, there's no point in running past something that's not interesting. There needs to be a purpose to each scene in your shot. You know, what are you doing it for? Are you going on a journey? Are you driving somewhere? Have you got a destination? Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about white balance. White balance is a big thing, 
Um, so most people, when they record, I mean, cameras do have an automatic white balance setting. So what the white balance is, it adjusts the coloration of, well, the color grading of your footage, really, depending upon what light you've got coming through and whether it's sunny or whether it's, you know, cloudy. I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail because it doesn't need a massive amount of detail about what white balance is and why it changes color. The, the key to note here is that Andrew and I have had a nightmare with white balance. And again, this affects your scale footage. So cameras like this, and so my Panasonic Lumix and Andrew's video camera, we find they're quite good. They, they seem to deal with white balance really quite well. And, you know, they, they seem to get it right most of the time. Mobile phones are an issue. Not quite so much the Samsung. It does do it. Uh, the GoPro is really quite bad for it. I found my GoPro Hero 3 black and this Hero 7 black, it tends to, in the woods, if it can't see the sky, it tends to go very blue, really blue, to the point where it's very difficult to adjust it afterwards. Now, the phone, Andrew's phone, I think he's gonna do a separate video possibly to talk about it, but his Huawei, that his phone in the woods tend to go, tends to go orange. It, it re and, I didn't really notice it at first. Andrew put it on to, you know, I, we, when we first started doing this, it was just, yeah, you know, let's film the trucks and they look cool and everything else. But Andrew really kind of got me onto it and now I can't stop seeing it. And it's very noticeable. And it's especially noticeable. You start a shot and you're recording and you press record and you go in from one area to another. So say for example, you know, this side of the camera was an open area that you can see the sky and then you pan round to a set of woods as the truck goes past and the trucks then drive into the woods and as they drive into the woods the camera sees a different set of light and it changes or it might not be able to see the sky anymore the white balance adjustment when it's on auto changes and then the footage changes color and what happens is you get this bang this this like almost like someone just like as 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 you've swapped cameras or and it doesn't look very good. I'm going to put some footage up now. Andrew said he's going to dig some out because his camera does it the most. Um, and, and you may not notice it until someone draws your attention to it, but we notice it all the time. You know, you're driving from one area to another and the footage goes clink and it changes and it's really frustrating. And we now are starting to lock the white balance. Now you can do that with most cameras. Now, phones are a little bit more of an issue, but Filmic Pro that we use allows you to lock the white balance all the time or lock the white balance just when you start recording. So that's really handy. So if you have got auto white balance, there's something you need to consider if you can't lock it because you know on, on the Lumix and I think on Andrew's video camera, you go into the settings and the white balance can be set to a K rating or it can be set to a cloudy day or something like that. So you leave it on the entire shoot so that it stays constant. But you know the reason why we use different cameras because that was done in section three. And when you use different cameras, different cameras will tend to use different white balance settings. They will all change. So the two Panasonics, the Lumix and the video camera, being that they're Panasonic, are very similar. So that's good. GoPro isn't. GoPro is different from those two. And the phones are different again. So that's something that you need to consider because it doesn't look scale. You know, when, when you're driving along and it, all of a sudden the light changes, you don't see that in professional filming. It's not something that, that makes it look professional. Um, and it really does uh, affect how the footage looks. So that's something that we're gonna work on and that we need to change. There's a number of our videos, if you look carefully, where that happens. And sometimes, it's all right saying you can do it in, you know, in editing, but sometimes you can't do it in editing. I've had it, especially with the GoPro, when it's been in the woods, it's so blue, even controlling it to get it to not look blue, it just changes the look of the f footage and it just doesn't look very good. So it's annoying. I'm gonna start experimenting with this about locking it to one color, especially in the woods. When you're out in the sunshine, in the open air, the GoPro is fantastic. It's really good on auto, no issues. As soon as you go into a, an environment where it can't see the sky, I found it to be quite annoying. So that's it really for section four, you know, to keep 
a mind about how you drive, you know, how, what angles you're getting, trying to make it look scale. The, the frustrating thing is, is obviously when you're out shooting, you look it back on the video screen or on the phone, it's always different when you get it back on the computer. So take your time and set the shots up. Think about what you're shooting. Don't just, you know, follow it around. You have to put the effort in. You don't get anything for free in life, ever. So, and you don't get a good video um, shots without putting the effort in. I mean, Andrew and I, we could be out for five, six hours and we'll get a three or four minute video out of that if we're lucky. And that involves miles of walking, lying on the floor. We always come across dog walkers and the dog walkers, they see these two guys in waterproofs, army waterproofs, lying down on the floor. And what on earth are you doing chasing this plastic truck? Um, but you have to, to make it look good. And it's trial and error and it's a lot of practice. So get out there and join us, folks. We've learned a lot over the two years, nearly two years we've been doing it and we feel our videos are really quite good. Um, we're by no means experts, but we think you know these tips are helpful. Multiple cameras, multiple tripods, it's effort, but you don't get anything good unless you put the effort in, so it's worthwhile. So we're gonna you know, improve things and we want to get our videos looking even better. So please stay with us on that journey. Hi everyone, it's Andrew, and I'm going to have a little talk to you about two of the statistics, two of the numbers associated with your video clips and that is bit rate and frame rate and now before we start any of that i'm just going to give you the information that as i understand it it may be it may be completely wrong but i don't i don't think it is i may miss some important bits out feel free to add those obviously in the comments like we said in the video for our 500th subscriber you know where we, we sort of floated this idea this is a journey for us and by no means are we at the end so we're just learning stuff as we go along um, I've learned a few bits and pieces over the last you know month or two just uh, and obviously I haven't finished researching them and I haven't certainly got to the point of, of having a great deal of proficiency but I think it's nice to sometimes bring people along at the beginning of a journey and if you guys are inspired and you want to go and do your own research and check out stuff your own way you, you'll end up maybe taking a slightly different path and ending up with a slightly different place and uh, I think sometimes when you spoon fed the entire full 100% picture then you, you kind of miss out on some of the some of the learning anyway that's enough of that so I'm just really saying if I make a cock up of this uh, you know I'm not an expert I'm not professing to be an expert with this okay right bit rates first uh, this is the MBPS rating on your video clips and uh, I, I think I'll splice a clip in uh, from the computer showing you a files MBPS now to cut long story short and believe me I've done takes of this video where I have made it a long story but to cut it really short your, your bit rate your MBPS your megabits per second is what that stands for is an indication of quality now I'm not going to tell you how much quality you get for 60 mbps versus versus 20 mbps i'm not i'm not going to try and grade them just simply to say that 60 mbps will be a lot better quality than 20 mbps which will be a lot better than 5 mbps so the higher the bitrate the better the quality don't confuse bitrate with resolution that's whether it's full hd standard definition, 4K, that's your number of pixels. Is it 38040? Is it 1920? Is it you know 720? What what are well the pixel numbers, the thousands, the hundreds, that's about how big a picture you're going to get. So that's bit rates, okay? In short, the higher the number you get, the better. Now before we move on, because I'm gonna I'm gonna give you opposite advice in terms of frame rates, but in terms of bit rates if you're shooting with different cameras, as I say, I've got my video camera giving me one bit rate, I've got my phone giving me another bit rate, I, I would and have and never noticed the join in quality levels, basically, by putting all these clips together. Okay, But generally speaking, we don't mess about with the bit rates per clip as we, as we, as we edit. Um, I just put them all in there and, and let the program sort them out. Um, Perhaps the finest example of bitrate differences and the quality level it can make is the difference between DVD and Blu-ray. Okay, if we kind of ignore the resolution, oh, it's Blu-ray, it's 4K, rah rah. 
yes, it's a bigger picture, but it's also a much more uh, quality packed, detail packed picture because the bit rate is four times or so higher on a, on a Blu-ray than it is on a DVD. That means, of course, if you watch them both at the same resolution, the same full HD screen size, that's all your TV can produce, 1920 by 1080, then the Blu-ray and the DVD are, are both playing in the same box. Uh, and then it's you'll still see a glaring difference in quality between the two discs because the Blu-ray, you know, you've kind of stripped away the 4K advantage, but the Blu-ray has got uh, something something like four times the quality, four times the bit rate. So that's 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 I guess uh, the best I, I can tell you the difference between bit rate and resolution. Okay, resolution is size, bit rate is quality. Okay, all good. Still with me? Still awake? Hello? Still awake? Good luck. There you go. Right. So, frame rates. Now, for frame rates, what are they? Well, we all know that movies are made by taking still images and flicking them past us really quickly. Like that. Okay? Now this camera shoots at about 10 frames a second, or it did in its glory days, it's a bit old now, it's probably a little bit less than 10 frames a second. Okay. Now, that will produce a series of still images and I could flick through them pretty quickly to produce a moving image. They are your frames. And how many of those frames you show per second is the statistic you'll see on your, on your, on your film clip. Now, what does it all mean? Well, again, the different cameras like the bit rates. The different cameras will shoot different frame rates. Um, my phone, for example, if I talk about 4K, my phone shoots 4K only in 30 frames a second. I get no choice. So I go 4K on this phone, it's 30 frames a second. My video camera shoots in 25 frames a second. Terry's Lumix shoots in 25 frames a second. So in 1080, in, in, in full HD, so your next resolution down, 30 I think, or 50, or, and if I go into the slow motion modes, I can go over 50, I can go up to 100, sort of, you know, 240, this kind of higher frames a second to slow the images down, and we'll come to why that works in a second. With frame rates, it does matter, and we're going to have a look at the computer in a minute, I'm going to take you into screenshots and screen grabs to show you an example, examples of how it matters and what happens if you get it you know, if you, well, if, what happens if you push the boundaries, let's say? I'm not going to say getting it right or wrong, because it's a personal, subjective thing, isn't it? But what I am going to say before we get to the computer is, Hollywood and the movie industry in general has settled on 24 frames a second as being the magic number. Now, I don't know why they've chosen 24 still images, click, 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 going past you every second. I suspect it's maybe something to do with that's a speed that our eyes are comfortable with. Not mine, because I'm as blind as a bat, but I don't, I don't, I don't think mine matter anymore. But generally speaking, I, th I, I, am, I can only imagine that it's, it's something to do with how our eyes interpret it. Because let's be honest, why would Hollywood pick a standard that our eyes weren't terribly happy about looking at? Hmm? They wouldn't. They would pick something that, that, that your eyes don't struggle with, which, would, which allows your brain to relax and believe in what it's seeing and not question it too much. Uh, and that's important because that means you can relax and engage and enjoy what you're watching. And obviously that's what we all want on YouTube, isn't it? We all want people to sit and relax and enjoy our videos. So I've taken, I'm, I'm not questioning it too hard. Hollywood knows better than I do. So I'm, I'm taking 24 frames a second nowadays as being gospel. That's what I'm aiming for. So 24 frames a second but I haven't got a camera that shoots at 24 frames a second, so what am I going to do? Well, let's dive into the software and let's examine this uh, paradox a little bit further. Much the same way that we looked at the bit rates, I can right click on my, soft, my, my video clip and I can have a look at its properties and it will tell me here to confirm this was shot at 50 frames a second. So that's 50 still images going past me every second. Beautiful. Play it and it's the MC8 splashing into a puddle with some enthusiasm and drowning its brand new BEC that I just installed. Um, what isn't filmed is me rewiring the servo directly off the receiver moments after this. Um, uh, just as well. 
So, frame rates. What's the deal? So, in, in short, I shot this at 50 frames a second consciously. We'll come to why in a minute. Uh, maybe you're shooting these things unconsciously. You're just choosing the highest quality level on your video camera or your phone. Then no harm in doing that. But what you are shooting, of course, is something that's producing 50 still images every second. You are going to get a lot of detail and your video is going to be nice and crisp. Maybe too crisp, some would argue. But it'll be nice and crisp as long as it's in focus and everything else. Now, I could render this. I could go off to my produce tab here in Power Director and I could render this and if I let Power Director do what it wants to do it will render this at 50 frames a second and all will be well. The video will come out looking just as it does there in the preview. If I start mucking about with the frame rate then it won't. So first thing I'm going to show you is a bit of a no-no and that is rendering your video at a different frame rate to the source material. So my video playing at one to one full speed, normal speed, is 50 frames a second. If I choose to render this at my recommended golden frame rate, I'm leaving the software no choice but to cut 26 frames every second and put them on the floor. I'm effectively trying to pour a pint into a half pint glass. There's going to be a mess. Okay? And the result of messing about like that, of mismatching your source file to your output file, the result of that will be a jerky video. Let me show you what happens. And the, uh, the, the example I'm going to show you isn't as extreme as 50 frames to 24. What I'm going to show you is 30 frames rendered at 25 frames. Not as big a difference, but the results are quite profound. The video in question is live, it's on our channel, you can go and have a look, point and laugh. Just add to my misery, why don't you? It's this one, the heavy haulage, the, the, the two MCs with the trailers and the logs and the towing and the MC6 drive shaft braking and good old MC8 dragging her back to the car park like a wounded animal. So the video camera and the and Lumix shoot at 25 frames, but the phone shoots at 30 in 4K. When it's rendered at 25, so the power director had to lose 5 frames every second of this clip you're about to see at the very front of the video. Does that look buttery smooth 24, or movie quality buttery smoothness? No. You can see them juddering, shaking across the screen. That's the result. Of going from 30 to 25. Can you imagine going from 50 to 25? Right now here's some footage on the same just moments later really shot on the big cameras at 25 frames a second rendered at 25 frames a second and I hope you can see how much smoother that is. You can see some motion on the tires you can see a bit of blur see if it can catch some. There, you can see it as I freeze it. You can see it's actually blurring the tyres. Now, that's 25, 24. Obviously, would be just slightly more realistic. After that, let's talk about what you can do about that. Hmm. So this whole clip is at 50 frames a second, like I showed you. Just remind ourselves, 50 frames a second there. Now, if I wanted to produce a 24 frames a second movie... As I said, I can't pour 50 frames a second into a 24 frames a second or 25 frames a second glass. It's going to be very messy. I'm going to lose half of it. So what I have to do instead is slow it down. Okay? So if I slow this down, well, let's just keep the math symbol by a half, 0.5. The clip gets twice as big, plonk, and it plays back at half speed. So I could now render this at 25 frames a second and I would get a nice buttery smooth slow motion clip. Yeah? But if I've got various frame rates going on because I've got to use different cameras then I'm going to have to balance out all the frame rates in all the clips to be the same end result. 
and the the problem with wanting 24 frames a second is I don't Terry and I don't have any cameras that shoot at 24 frames a second. We can convince the phones to do it using Filmic Pro, so that's cool. But native camera apps in the phones shoot at 25, or 30, or 50. So, you know, if I want a 24 frames a second movie, I'm having to slow every clip down by a factor to produce a real effect of 24 frames a second. And it's a bit tedious, and it means inevitably either very long videos or you have to cut lots out. So let me show you what happens if you slow it down too much as well. This is an interesting little exercise. If I slow this down past 24, 25 even, okay, let's just say I would like to see this at tenth speed. What happens then? A factor of 0.1. Whoa, suddenly it gets really big. Well, let's just see the difference. Come on, let's find something. Here we go. Can you see what's happening? Does that look buttery smooth to you? No. I'm effectively, it's interesting to watch the water patterns, but I'm effectively getting, the simple math tells me, 50 frames a second times 0 .0, uh, 0 0.1. That's 10 times reduction. 5 frames a second. 5 frames a second you're looking at there. Tick, 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 tick. Okay. If I go even slower, well, you know, you could put pictures on your desk faster. It is like a very slow flicker book, isn't it? So, you slow it down too far, guys. Do the maths. Be aware when you're slowing your movies down what effective frame rate you're ending up with and if it's lower than 24 people are going to notice okay all right there's your frame rates um back to the studio okay so i hope that was interesting and i hope you've uh, picked up a few bits and pieces like i say there's no there's no real right or wrong here uh for me if you're shooting it if you want to stick at 25 as as you know that, that some of the cameras are shooting if you want to, if you want to shoot everything on on 30 frames a second on a phone and your entire video is at that then then don't worry about it I, i'm not sure i would worry about it to be honest um but do do bear in mind that if you're going to mix the frame rates up and then and then render at a fixed rate the the software you're edit, your editing software does have to f work does have to do something you know you're putting a lot of frames in and you're asking it to produce only some of those frames so you are going to have to lose some out somewhere so that's that's the thing i think you should avoid that's what i would recommend you avoid so there you go that's the end of my little um schooling session so far that's what i've learned in the videos that you're producing that we're producing now sort of november december 2019 onwards i certainly will be producing them at 24 frames a second regardless of what they're shot in um, because I think that's, that's uh, going to give us a level of consistency. And again, if people are going to watch more than one of our videos at once, God love you if you do, then I, I'd like to have a consistency. You know. So that's, I think, what I'll be, I'll be doing. Terry is, is free to do his own thing as, as uh, you know, there's two of us. It's not, it's not a tyranny. Um, so uh, that's, that's certainly what my movies will, will be producing in 24 now. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you for watching, and I hope you check out the rest of Terry's long video because it's worth it. You know, um, we tried diluting this down into sound bites; uh, it does, just doesn't work. It becomes meaningless. And do check out YouTube in general, Google for a lot more of this information um, from <laughs> people a lot better qualified to tell you. Um, but anyway, I shouldn't shoot myself down. Enjoy. Thank you for watching, and good night. I think mean, we have plans. Obviously, we have plans. I think mean, we have plans. Obviously, we have plans. We have plans every day to spend money, but. Hi everyone, it's Andrew. A uh, bit of a surprise, Terry was going to be doing this one, but uh, he's, he's not well, bless. So in order to hit our publishing deadline, I'm doing it instead. Now this is chapter 5, and chapter 5 is all about what are our, what are our plans for the, for the future, for next year. We're at the end of 2019 now. So, if I can backtrack through what I believe the order of this video is going to be. What plans have we got for our gear? Well, we haven't really got any plans. Um, my new S10 Plus has arrived, 
So that's really cool. I've got my moment anamorphic lens to match Terry's coming very shortly, I hope. So no plans to upgrade the, the main cameras. No money to upgrade the main cameras, mainly. That's the problem. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, for gear-wise, we're going to pretty much have a static gear, I think. Uh, we've now really just got to master the gear that we have. So we're going to be doing some more anamorphic shooting with two phones this time, which is going to make it much easier. There will be many videos, I think, where we go out with just the phones and no, no main camera. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting, an interesting experience. I think, uh, especially with this S10 Plus, it has a telephoto lens as well, so I can get a close-up, I can get a telephoto shot, which traditionally is what the video camera has been used for. So that's kind of interesting. Could be a little bit of a limitation as well. I don't have quite the control with the phone that I do with the video camera, so we'll see how that goes. But in terms of in terms of adding stuff, no, we've kind of now got we've spent out. We're, we've got all everything we need. Um, I may get a fluid head tripod like Terry's, I may not, uh, I'm not sure we really need two of them, so uh, yeah, that that's, I'm, I'm not so sure we need two, to be honest. So, gear wise is what it is now, um, in terms of the videos themselves, yes, we are going to change things up, continue trying to change things up with the videos. The first thing we're going to try and do is increase the consistency with the videos in terms of the gloss the polish that's on them uh, you the, the um, things like the intros the, the endings and stuff like that that kind of consistency is very nice um, if we can increase that I'm working on some opening titles right now I know Terry's just got a, a new editing software for his computer Final Cut so he's, he's excited about that and that can do lots of interesting um, text and, and so on. So we're going to try and gloss up the, the, the intro and perhaps the ending of the videos. Um, things like chapters I'd like to learn how to use properly. So you guys can, in videos like this, you, you, you can have chapters built into the video that YouTube would recognize. So the, the, there's a few technical things um, that each video hopefully ca can have applied to them moving forward. The content of the videos though is also going to change. So maybe constant with the gloss, but variable with the content. We've got a few plans for, for, for content. We're getting a bit tired with the woodland, mud, you know, muddy banks. It doesn't matter which of the woodlands we go to. They, they kind of all end up looking the same on the video. The same colors, same thing. So the first thing we've done already is to get into an urban environment. We were both quite excited. Um, to get out the other, the other like m last month when Terry got his new moment lens, we started in the local town um, and ended up in the playground. Hope you go back. I might put a link to that somewhere around here. That video came out uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and that was pretty exciting to go and see, to, to go and do that, shoot the trucks in a different environment. It was actually quite nice. They didn't come home muddy. <laughs> that was a nice thing. Um, uh, you know the setup of the truck could technically be different although we didn't we didn't change the truck around at all so that that was a good challenge and we're going to move that on um, we're going to move that into the center of London we are planning to go into London to the tourist spots in front of Tower Bridge you know the castle sorry yeah London the, the Tower of London as I think it's called the castle thing by the river um, uh, how's the Parliament? You know, no, we can't shoot probably actually on the premises, <coughs> but we could uh, we could probably have it in the background certainly. So we're going to try and do something like that, which would be quite exciting. The probability is we're going to take the little trucks, the WPLs, because just for size and portability, um, you can't park uh, terribly easily in the centre of London. So we've got to carry the truck to where we're going to film it and then pick it up and carry it back. We're not driving the MCs through. Um, down, down the south bank uh, of the Thames, it's just going to be a carnage. So we, we're, we're probably going to take the little trucks for certain, and maybe the four by fours if we feel brave. That might be for the second visit. See how the first one goes down. Um, so yeah, content-wise, we've got some deserted castles, uh, churches, and things, and deserted old ruined buildings. We're going to try and run the trucks around. Uh, we're going to try and get to the coast when the weather, when when the 
the, the, we get a bit more sunshine basically we get about six hours of daylight at the moment Terry and I live quite inland so to get to a coast and do some filming it'd be dark by the time we got started so um, we're, we're going to try and do that maybe spring summer time get down to the beach take some shots of these uh, on, on the by the white cliffs of Dover for example might be quite cool so content wise we're hoping to try and switch it up a little bit from the woodland thing um, speaking of WPL trucks, now the con to the actual things we're shooting, yeah, so the final part of the of, of the uh, video equation, I guess. This is my beloved gas. So you've maybe seen it. There's one video of this running on the channel from uh, a while back now. I, hit, I don't, don't want to say what I don't even want to say it was the last year. It might even be. Sorry, I don't want to say it's this year, 2019. It might be. Might even be 2018. Um, I ran this and I broke it. I've stripped a tooth, I think, off one of the front. Uh, it's not the back, because the back, I've examined that, and that works fine. I think it's the... Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it's the front uh, axle has lost a tooth, maybe, in the run. It, it's on film, and uh, halfway through the run, it shed a tooth, I think. So um, I'm going to fix this up, and I've got a whole bunch of WPL parts arrived from Black Friday, and I'm going to put pretty much every conceivable upgrade on this that I can, to weigh it down, get some weight on the because it's a bit boingy boingy at the moment. Get some weight on it, get these leaf springs compressed, uh, make them work for a living. So, the WPLs are going to feature quite heavily. Neither Terry and I have got a huge amount of budget left for uh, a new truck in the, in, in the you know, sort of winter, spring time. So, our planned trip to green models may have to be put off until summertime and so on. Um, so, the WPL trucks. Um, are going to feature quite heavily, I think, um, in the coming months. I've ordered uh, one of the new WPL FJ45s all metal kit with the wooden um, load bed on the back. It's got the extended wheelbase, uh, it's the, the, the all metal KM kit that they've just announced recently. So I've got one of those coming, which I'm quite excited about. So it's going to be a complete build and painting project. Terry's ordered uh, a, a juice and a half. Uh, four-wheel drive version, 4x4, four four. his 6x6 six six, you might remember he had, didn't last long. So he's buy, buying the all-metal upgraded version of the 4x4 four four, Deuce and a Half, which is uh, also going to be quite exciting. So they'll probably be what we take to uh, London, and they'll certainly feature in a couple of build videos and stuff like that. We're, we're maybe going to, we're just today discussing the idea of a, of, a, of a build of the two of us, sat around the table building these WPL trucks, because they don't take long, and uh, maybe we could put a nice video together like that. I did wonder about a live video, live stream. I know it kind of a lot of people do these now. Um, let us know if you're interested in in a, in a live stream uh, broadcast. I'm, I'm not convinced it, they, that they make that good TV, and I'm not convinced we've really got the gear for it either. But uh, if if a live stream thing is 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 something of interest, then maybe you know we'll consider it for the future. So yeah, the WPL is a quite interesting little thing to keep uh, to, to to move on with for a little while. Um, oh, and I've got one of the tanks, one of those little SG tanks coming as well. The um, was it ripsaw, the, the, the little forty quid ripsaw off Banggood. That's coming as well for my son's Christmas present. Yeah. Um, well, I only see him once a fortnight, so you know, it, it'd be a shame if it sat on the on the shelf for twelve days, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, it'd be sitting on the back of the MC8 probably most of its time. Um, shh, don't tell him. Anyway. That's, um, yeah, so, so in terms of trucks, that's what it is. In terms of videos, we're changing up the location. In terms of gear, we're not doing a great deal. Um, we're going to polish the videos up a little bit more. <coughs> and I think just, yeah, we're going to watch our frame rates. That's something we've just really got used to doing, or got, certainly got to become more aware of. So that's uh, going to be a big thing for next year. We're going to try and smooth out the frame rate, smooth out the production qualities um, of the videos that we're doing. Um, uh, Terry's not sure, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of with him on this. Uh, what uh, 4K or 1080? We're not really sure what we're doing. 4K is a great resolution to shoot in, because you 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 get so much detail, so much quality there. Even when you put shoot in 4K and then produce a video in 1080, you still get a step up in quality from shooting in 1080. You know, and, and showing it in 1080. If you shoot in 4K, it crams in a lot more detail, even if you downscale it to 1080 at the end it still looks better so I'm not sure what we're going to be shooting in too much um, if, if 4k is a big deal to you guys could you let us know uh, if, if you're generally just watching stuff in 1080 
then let us know as well so we, we know roughly where we're aiming at um, 1080 obviously is a lot easier on the computers uh, and, it, and it's a lot easier to handle it's a lot easier to download it's less hassle for the camera to shoot it doesn't chew batteries up it, 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 uh, you know, 4k really is a bit hard work to, to uh, physically deal with the results may be worth it but uh, the, the end result uh, is a hard work to get there so let us know about that we might be shooting more in 1080 than we do now um, that aside though the only plan we've really got is just to get better at doing these videos so they don't take so long to do and yet the that would be the ideal thing less time doing them but better end result because really this is where it is and this is it's the RC it's an RC hobby it's not a photography film video hobby um, personally I'd rather spend more time doing this than doing this but um, it, at the moment it's more this than that so uh, yeah well I'm gonna, that, that will be a big aim as well keep the quality going up but spend more time with the trucks uh, yeah there you go so that's that's pretty much our plans we'd love to hear yours if you've got any great plans or anything you want us to do any suggestions you think we could do uh, but have a lovely day thank you for watching so much and I know Terry would like to say that as well but he's he's uh, he may splice a bit on to uh, also pass his comments on but if not happy Christmas from the both of us thank you for watching and we will catch you in 2020 when it's gonna go anamorphic baby oh yeah all right it's a wrap Terry I'm done